Yeah, we're done, brother. We got just a few minutes uh, before it's time to get started. I wanted to uh, remind everyone about the uh, the choir fellowship this coming Saturday at five o'clock, and hope hopefully everyone uh, can come out and be with us. It's just a, a casual time of uh, getting to know each other better, uh, and just a time of fellowship. Uh, so you don't you don't have to wear a suit and tie. Uh, <laughs> that's for me. I hate wearing a suit and tie, okay? But uh, I want to encourage you to do that. I'm looking forward to it, and I, I think it'll be good for all of us. I uh, want to welcome you tonight, this evening. Hope you're having a good week. And if you're not having a good week, this is a good place to be to make sure tomorrow goes better. Amen? Let's take the church hymn. on stand up and turn to page number 264. We'll do the first, second, and last verse, 264. standing turn to page number 379 379 a wonderful wonderful old song by William Cowper there is a fountain
number three and skip number four. I love number three. Ever since my pain, I saw the stream. given us a beautiful day and we have a, a lot to be thankful for tonight. I have. Amen. I've got a lot to be thankful for. And I can always tell what kind of spiritual shape I'm in as to how much thankfulness is rising up from inside my soul and let the Lord know how much I appreciate what he's done for me because he found me in a waste howling wilderness. Amen. You would have run Ezekiel. That's where he found me. Father, bless your word tonight and the time we have together in your house. I pray this now in the name of the Lord Jesus. Amen. Lucas just got back. He went to Brownsville, Texas and crossed from Brownsville over into Mexico and then went up in the mountains. And it's quite an experience. And he told about the souls that got saved. You want to tell them? Go ahead and stand up and give them a little a cap of what's happened there. Bottom line is that you have to see some things, you just can't get them from a book, and you have to be there. And uh, and that was a good experience. And fifteen souls were saved. He said they told him, uh, uh, kind of shy away from the food in the city, but out in the country, he said the food was good. Yeah, he said they had no running water, no electricity. I don't think bathrooms or anything like that. They lived a very rudimentary type life. Amen. We've got a lot to be thankful for and take for granted, don't we? Yes, we do. Well, if you have your Bibles, if you'd like to turn with me tonight, the Gospel of John. The Gospel of John. John. John chapter number one. And verse one. The beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The same was in the beginning with God, and all things were made by Him, and without Him was not anything made that was made. In Him was life, and the life was the light of men. The light shineth in darkness, and the darkness comprehended it not. Father, bless this book. In your holy name, amen. You can be seated. The Council of Nicaea in 325 A.D. was called to hammer out, to deal with the issue of men like Arius, who taught that Christ was a created being. And, of course, uh, Judge Rutherford and the rest of them back in the 1800s uh, jumped on Arius's bandwagon, and they've been teaching that Christ is a created God uh, ever since then, and these are the Jehovah's Witnesses. If you're a Jehovah's Witness, I don't hate you. I just wish you'd listen because you don't know the Lord Jesus Christ. You don't have a clue. He is God. That's what it just said. In John chapter number 1, the Word was with God, and the Word was God. In verse 13 it says, uh, in the verse 14 it says, And the Word was made flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld His glory. The glory is of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. So the Word made flesh. There's no question. In 1 Timothy chapter 3 and verse number 16, it says, Without controversy, great is the mystery of godliness. God 
was manifest in the flesh. Most of the new Bibles say he who was manifest in the flesh. Why would they mess with that? Because that directly uh, uh, affects the deity of Christ. They'll come back and say, well, in other places in the New Testament, it affirms his deity. Why mess with that one? So it gets into manuscript evidence. Uh, the uh, uh, Nestle Allen's critical apparatus, how many have ever heard of that? Some of you have, some of you haven't. The critical apparatus of Nestle Allen is simply this. It shows you every word in the New Testament, and it shows you the manuscript authority for that word. Of all the material available, uh, like Sinaiticus Vaticanus, the majority text, uh, unctuals and cursives and all the rest of electionaires, they go back and they look at all of the evidence available to support whether that word should be in the text or should there be another word, so forth and so on. See, that's important. That's important. Not one place, not one place, and this is a challenge to any of them listening. You've been to school, you know what I'm talking about. Not one place in that New Testament where they change the translation based on this, that, this, that, can they prove it from that critical apparatus? They can't do it. There's no authority for it. In plain words, the New Testament that you've got in your hands when it says, without controversy, great is the mystery of godliness, God was manifest in the flesh, they have absolutely no authority to change it. Amen. It's that simple. So why am I making such a big deal? Because we're going to talk about his deity tonight. The church is dying because they don't know who Christ is, folks. Amen. It's very important to understand. Here's what's happening. The church is in a transition period. It's transitioning from the Christ that your grandfather and great-grandfather preached 50, 75, 100 years ago, which was the true Christ. It is transitioning over into the Antichrist, a pseudo-Christos, a false Christ. And that's and right smack in the middle of it right now. So when you talk to the average American that goes to the church, goes to church every Sunday, they don't have a clue who they're really, who they're worshiping. And there's another Jesus, there's another spirit, and there's another gospel. And I'm a bishop of a local assembly, so he holds me accountable according to the book of Hebrews chapter 13. I'm accountable. I must give an account. And so that's what I'm doing tonight. I'm giving an account because I'll stand and be judged for what I say to, to you tonight about the identity of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Believe is the theme of the Gospel of John. Believe seems to be a very simple word. You believe this, believe that, so forth. The word believe in several forms shows up 98 times in the Gospel of John. The words life and live show up 55 times in the Gospel of John. To believe God is to trust his integrity. You understand? You got a hold of that? So he's doing this. He's telling you, you trust my integrity. You trust my character. You trust who I am. Let me give you an analogy. If a man gives you something and then later takes it back or wants to take it back, it's not an issue of what he gave you. That's really not what's important. What's important is his word when he said he gave it to you. That's what's important. The word is everything. If a man gives you something and then takes it back, then his word can no longer be trusted and his character can no longer be trusted. And this is what we get into in the Gospel of John. This is so important. This is why John said, these things are written that you might believe. Can we believe it? Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, the four Gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke are called synoptic Gospels. And this is a total arbitrary statement. There's no, as I've told you before, uh, when you study the New Testament, you'll find out to try to make a harmony of the Gospels is a, is a very difficult thing because they're really not written to harmonize. Each, uh, each apostle has his own perspective, his own reason for writing. And so Matthew, Mark, and Luke have their reason, and so does John. John is the last gospel written, written somewhere along 90, 95 A.D., and the Gospel of John is the only one that mentions the new birth. And here's what's so important about the Gospel of John. The whole burden of the Gospel of John is the salvation of the sinner's soul. It's not building anybody's kingdom. The kingdom of heaven is not mentioned. 
There's no building in it. It's about the salvation. And it is connected directly with believing. Remember, this is why integrity is so important. Can we take God at his word? If God says, I give unto them eternal life and they shall never perish, is that what he means? Well, that means that they'll never perish. That's exactly what it means. You see, why I say that is because the gospel of John is without question from the first chapter to the last chapter, a gospel that absolutely supports eternal life. You'll never find, you'll never find, you'll never find someone who believes that you can lose your salvation take you to the gospel of John. They shy away from the gospel of John as much as they can. They'll run you to Matthew 24, where it has to do with the Jews and the tribulation period. They'll take you to places like that, but they'll never take you to the gospel of John. And the reason for that, for example, like John chapter number 10, I'm in my father's hand and no man can pluck you from that hand. You have eternal life. You're sealed in the hand of God. So they leave it alone. They stay away from it. Now, obviously, it presents a problem. If they think you can lose your salvation and yet the gospel of John is adamant about the fact that you cannot lose your salvation, then we have an issue. Does the Bible contradict itself? No. As I've said so many times before, anytime something shows up in the Bible that appears to be contradictory, that's, that is an open door. It's a place for you to begin to cry out to God and ask him, Lord, show me, teach me. Where am I coming short? What do I need to know? How does this fit? The scripture says that all scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable, all scripture. It is. From Genesis to Revelation, every verse in the Bible, so so and so beget so and so who beget so and so who beget so and so. Where are you out with the beginnings? But the truth of the matter is it's still scripture. And it is given by inspiration of God. But it, all scripture is not written to you. And it may not be written for you or the age that you're alive. Remember, it took nearly 2,000 years to write the Bible. If the first book of the Bible being Job was written by who we have no idea about 1900 B.C. Now, I, hear, I know you hear most of the time it took 1,500 years to write the Bible. Well, that's kind of playing with numbers. I'm not sure because the, the oldest book in the Bible is Job, and he's a contemporary of Abraham, and that's about 1,900 B.C., so here we are, 100 A.D. almost, writing the New Testament, finishing it. What have we got? 2,000 years. Now think about something that it took 2,000 years to write. Think about that. By men who had no idea who each other were. They're living in totally separate times, different places. Yet there's something about the Bible that pulls it together. And so this is what I'm talking about tonight. Believe. I'm not going to cast any aspersions on Matthew, Mark, and Luke. They have their place. There's a reason for them. They belong in the New Testament. But the book of Matthew, Mark, and Luke is not dealing with the issue like John is. John's issue is faith, belief, and eternal life. And who's presented in the Gospel of John? The Lord Jesus Christ from cover to cover. So I want you to look at some of it with me tonight. Look at John chapter number 1 and verse number 4. The Scripture says in him was life, and the life was the light of men. Well, the light reveals spiritual realities in our lives. It's when the light shows up in the hardened, darkened soul of a sinner that he begins to realize who and what he is. That light must come first. And where does this light come from? It doesn't come from man. It comes from the Holy Spirit. You remember the tabernacle? When you go through the door, not the gate, you have to go through the door to get into the holy place. It is in there that the candelabrum, seven golden candlesticks, are illuminating the table of showbread, the table of showbread, which of course is a type of the body of Christ. So yes, it, light, it illumines. The Bible says in John chapter number one and verse number eight, uh, uh, John 1, uh, uh, 1, 9 rather, that was the true light which lighteth every man that cometh into the world. Now if you want to have a have an excursion off into La La Land, get about 15 commentaries and see what all they say about that scripture. Some of them will completely change the wording of it to say coming into the world he was the light that lighted, that lit men or something of that nature. But when you look at this thing, you have to say to yourself, well, why would you want to change that? Ask yourself this question. Anytime you see something changed in the Bible, ask that question. Why did you change that? 
What's the point here? Why would you, why would you change one word, see? Why? There's, there's, there's an agenda going on, believe me. And the person that does it may not be aware of that agenda. But the scripture says right here in verse 9, that was the true light which lighteth every man that cometh into the world. Say, preacher, I don't necessarily have an answer for that. I may not necessarily have one either, but I believe it. And see, that's the difference. I'm a Bible believer. I may not be able to take this and break it down and unpack it as they say today, but that's all right. I'm not God. I didn't write the book, but I believe the book. So we'll leave it at that. He's the light that lighteth every man that cometh into the world. Light is a subject of the Gospel of John. It reveals spiritual realities. Look at John chapter number 3 and verse number 14. John 3, 14. And as Moses lifted up the serpent of the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up. All right, so what have we got here? Well, light illumines the work of Christ. If your spirit is not exalting the cross of the Lord Jesus Christ, you got the wrong spirit. Now, your spirit may be telling you how wonderful you are and how God wants to bless you and how that he can make you rich. And if you learn the secrets of this and secrets of that, you know that there, there's no telling what you can do. But if you are not hearing the cross of Christ preached, you have a devil spirit because this is the second thing. This is part of the light. He was exalted. He's lifted up. He said, if I be lifted up from the earth, I'll draw all men unto me. As Moses lifted up the serpent of the wilderness, that's what we call a type. It's typology. It's a picture of the lifting up of Christ, which, of course, is the cross. So if you're going to preach light and life and Christ, then you're going to show that. John did. Look at John chapter number 3 and verse number 36. John 3, 36. He that believeth on the Son will have eternal life, and he that believeth not the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God abideth on him. Did I mess up? Big time. Let's read it the way it says it. He that believeth on the Son hath now everlasting life. That means that he has to take that everlasting life away from you. Remember how we started? The integrity of God. I give unto them eternal life. They shall never perish. If you could lose it, those are meaningless words. Exactly. This falls on the character of the one making the promise. So, what do we have here? Eternal life is a present possession. Amen. That, that, that flies in the face of working your salvation. That flies in the face of salvation being a reward for a good life. God will reward you for a good life. He certainly will. At the judgment seat of Christ, he will reward you for a good life. But it has nothing to do with the salvation of your soul. That can only be bought by the Christ at the cross. And it can only be attained by faith believing. These things are written that you might believe. Now look at John chapter number 4 and verse number 14. And he's already taken us quite a ways. John 4, 14. Whosoever drinketh of the water that I shall give him shall never thirst. Never? Would this be, would, uh, if you could lose your salvation, would this, what would this mean? See what I mean? You see how that if, see, you see once you move, it, once, you, once you deviate, depart from the idea that God has given you eternal life and this life will never leave you, then all the rest of these promises are just conditional promises. They really don't mean anything. But whosoever drinketh of the water that I shall give him shall never thirst. But the water that I shall give him shall be in him a well of water springing up into everlasting life. A present possession of something that totally satisfies the soul. Music will never satisfy my soul. Preaching will never satisfy my soul. Church fellowship will never satisfy my soul. Big buildings and bigger buildings will never satisfy my soul. But Christ has and will satisfy my soul. Amen. He's everything I need. And he has and will satisfy my soul. So this is a present inward satisfaction. The Old Testament waters, the waters of Jerusalem, the waters of Shiloh. And today they call them the pool of Siloam, which means sent. He goes down into the pool, and it's remarkable, too, how in the last few years they've discovered this huge pool. The archaeologists have found it. Remember, I've told you 
The archaeologist is one of the best friends you have. He will never hurt you. The, you wish him the best. Get him out there digging. The archaeologist is the best thing that ever happened for the New Testament because every time he puts his shovel to the ground or a spade or whatever, he, up, he opens up supportive, supportive facts, supportive history of the Word of God. Amen. And they have found the pool of Siloam. Huge, beautiful pool where the waters that run softly flow down into it. And, and it's just been in the last few years. The archaeologists have found it. There it is. So this satisfaction of the water. Now don't you look at John chapter number 5 and verse number 24. And I'm going to tell you something too. The Jews have some of the finest archaeologists in the world. Yes, sir. I mean, they do. Because there are a lot of Jews over there, folks, in the Hebrew University and places like that, who believe the Tanakh. They believe Genesis through Malachi. And they know that the archaeologist is going to support that book, that scripture. And so they, they trained them and trained them well. Uh, he said in verse number 24, John, uh, John chapter number 5, what did I say to you? What scripture did I give you here? Let me, see. Let me go back here and look at this. John 5, 24, he said, Verily, verily, I say unto you, He that heareth my word and believeth on him that sent me hath everlasting life and shall not come, now watch this, into condemnation, but is passed from death unto life. He will never stand at the great white throne judgment. See, he'll never do that. You have to have eternal life to be assured that you'll never stand at the great white throne judgment. Or you won't. Now, a witness, yes. As a witness, sure, but you will, not be, you will not stand there to be judged. You were judged when the Lord Jesus Christ was judged on the cross because you were in him, amen, when he died for you. Now look at John chapter number 6 and verse number 40. John chapter number 6 and verse number 40. This is the will of him that sent me, that everyone which seeth the Son and believeth on him may have everlasting life, and I will raise him up at the last day. You see that? This is the will of him that sent me. I'm the sent one, the apostle of our faith, that everyone which seeth the Son and believeth on him may have everlasting life, and I will raise him up at the last day. That's quite remarkable. It really is. Because the Lord Jesus Christ is the one that we absolutely and completely identify with. I'm not trusting the Baptist church to get me to heaven. And if I preached a thousand years, I wouldn't trust that to get me to heaven. I don't trust any school that I've been to, any fellowship I belong to, any of the works that I've ever done. That will not get me to heaven, folks. It must be through the Lord Jesus Christ. And we're going to find out a little more about him here now. Look at John chapter number 10, verse number 26. John 10, 26 says this, but ye believe not because you're not of my sheep. As I said unto you, my sheep hear my voice and I know them and they follow me and I give unto them eternal life and they shall never perish. Neither shall any man pluck them out of my hand. My Father which gave them me is greater than all, and no man is able to pluck them out of my Father's hand. I don't know of a greater security than that. There's nothing greater, folks. You remember what I told you? If somebody's going to try to convince you that you can lose your salvation, he'll not do it from the Gospel of John. If you know the Gospel of John, like we're going through tonight, you'll embarrass him or her. And they'll have to run. And most of them, you know, uh, don't have a clue, like I've told you so many times, how that the Gospel of John, the last Gospel written long after the kingdom of heaven was rejected, it, meant, it mentions the new birth. And the new birth, think about this now, you must be born again, all right, born of God. Then by being born again and born of God, 
You literally have become a son of God by the new birth. This means that you are a son of God with eternal life. And that life cannot be taken from you. Nobody can pluck you from his hand. And notice the wording. My father which gave them me is greater than all. And no man is able to pluck them out of my father's hand. You see, no man knows the father but the son. No man knows the son but the father. If I be lifted up from the earth, he said, I will draw all men unto me. Everything that is done, everything that is done is done in coordination of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. It's the working of the Trinity, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. It is. When Christ came into the world, he came by the will of the Father. But the Son chose to come, lay his life down. But everything he did, he did it by the power of the Holy Spirit of God, not by his own power. So they're working in conjunction and coordination with each other. When the spirit of truth has come, who's the Holy Ghost, he'll not speak of himself. He'll speak of Christ. He'll point the Lord Jesus out to you. And you know, it's a shame for me to have to say something like this tonight. If I were, say, if I were up here 50 years ago uh, speaking, preaching like this, well, you hear this everywhere. There'd be nothing unique about this ministry and what I'm saying. And those of you been around for a while, you know what I'm talking about. But today, what I'm saying tonight is so foreign for most people. They don't hear anything like this. Isn't that sad? What a shame that the church has come to. Satan's smart, folks. We're not ignorant of the wiles of the devil. It's taken him decades. He's got patience. It's taken him decades to get the church to where it is tonight. And the church tonight, for the most part in America, is preaching a false gospel and a false Christ, and they're laying the foundation for the Antichrist. Amen. And it's just a matter of time before he shows up. In John chapter number 11 and verse 25, he gets into the I am's. And he said unto her, I am the resurrection and the life. He that believeth in me, though he were dead, yet shall he live. And whosoever liveth and believeth in me shall never die. Believest thou this? This means that the Lord Jesus Christ is the consummation and perfection of everything that God does to or with mankind. It all is focused and completed in Christ. Second man, last Adam. He said, I am the resurrection. And we know if we study the Bible, there's more than one re resurrection. We know that. There's a few of them, as a matter of fact. There's a resurrection in the middle of the tribulation, one at the front, one at the back of it. There's three right there. But there are other resurrections. And, but he said, I'm all of them. He said, I am. He didn't say, I am a resurrection. He said, I am the resurrection and the life. That's what he said. Now, how do you understand all of that? I'm not so sure I do understand all of it. But here's the thing. I'm a Bible believer. I believe it. Amen. Amen. That takes a load off of you. Did you know that? If you go around sweating yourself to death trying to figure out every little thing and trying to, you know, if something stumped you, and there's some things that stump you. At least one stumps me. In 1 Corinthians it says, they that are baptized for the dead. Have you read that one? What's that mean? Well, I heard a preacher say, well, they're good. I've heard preachers say too. This preacher said. <laughs> but what does it mean, baptized? Well, we say it's a figurative thing, okay. Are you sure? In plainer words, there are passages in the Bible that just don't, don't lend themselves to easy interpretation. So what do you do? Well, I believe the Bible. It fits somewhere. Amen. You ever work a, 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 a what do they call the puzzles? There you got all these pieces that you put. The jigsaw puzzle. And <laughs> we were kids. <laughs> We'd cut the corners up and off and ram it in there and make it fit. <laughs> How many's ever done that? Raise your hand. Good night, man. I'm not the only one who did that. Cut the corner off. We had, we had quite a scene, boy. <laughs> After you cut off all the corners and make it fit. Well, I'm afraid some people try to do the Bible like that. They, 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 they've got certain things they believe, and I'm going to make it say what I want it to say. Well, leave it alone. The book's the book. So he said, I'm the resurrection. Now, in the Gospel of John, there are the I am's. But they're based on this. Remember now, the Gospel of John is written to lay down the deity of Christ and believe in him. Exodus chapter number 3 and verse 14. And God said, Moses, I am that I am. 
And he said, Thus shalt thou say to the children of Israel, I am hath sent me unto you. Well, he has no ending and he has no beginning. He needs nothing. He's sustained by nothing. He doesn't need to breathe. He doesn't need to eat. He needs no place. He needs nothing. He's God. I honestly tonight, honestly, from the depths of my soul, cannot explain to you the element that God lived in before he created everything that's been created. But folks, everything that exists came forth from that creator. Remember, he predates creation. Nothing. So what element did he, did, he, did he live in? I have no idea. That's another one of those things. I'm a Bible believer. I'll leave it alone. Maybe one day he'll let us know. But you see, he said, I am that I am. I am everlasting. I am eternal. I am almighty. I am me. I am God. That's what he said. Amen. I hope you don't, didn't misunderstand. Think I said I'm God tonight. <laughs> No, 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 no. He is the almighty, everlasting, eternal, absolute being that needs nothing. So this is what he said. <laughs> so the Lord Jesus, when he comes into the Gospel of John, the Greek is ego aimi. So what is that? Well, that is an emphatic thing. In other words, it's saying, I am, with emphasis, with passion, with power and authority. This is what he's saying. The word ego, taken over into English. How many of you know what that word is in English? Somebody said, it's ego. Exactly. That's what's called a transliteration. What you've done, you've taken the Greek letters, and you've simply taken them and put them into another language, and there they are. E-G-E, E-G-O, Epsilon, Gamma, and Omega. I think it's Omicron or Omega. I forget which one. But ego, which is ego, in English. Now, ego in English, of course, has to do with a uh, philosophical things, put it that way. It has to do with some sort of a character trait, right? But in, in Greek, we're not talking about character traits. We're talking about identity and essence. I am that I am. So he said, I'm the bread of life in John 6, 35. Jesus said unto them, I am the bread of life. He that cometh to me shall never hunger. And he that believeth on me shall never thirst. Is he the bread of life? Certainly he is. And you never will. If you're hungry tonight and you thirst tonight, it's because you haven't been drinking and eating. Amen. You're, you're fasting. <laughs> you're on a spiritual fast. How you doing? How long has it been since you've uh, feasted on Christ? You need the Lord, folks. You need him every day. In John chapter number 8 and verse number 12, he said, I'm the light of the world. Spake Jesus to them, saying, I'm the light of the world. He that followeth me shall not walk in darkness, but shall have the light of life. So what does that mean? That means that the spirit that worketh in the children of disobedience always has a certain spirit for the age. I've watched that spirit change and transition in the few years I've been here. I've never seen anything like the one that's out there now. There's quite a spirit working in the children of disobedience now. It is. For one thing, it's a spirit of confusion. It is. I mean, there's a lot of confusion going on. But anyway, don't get off on a, a side note. If you love the Lord. Jesus and read his word and pray and walk in fellowship with the Lord. You will be, you will not. be part of the scene of the spirit of 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 the of, of the flow the trend that's going on today a wise man a hundred years ago said this he said find out which way the world's headed and go in the opposite direction and you won't be far off <laughs> That's pretty good, pretty good uh, counsel. He said this in John chapter number 10 and verse number 7. Verily, verily, I say unto you, I am the door of the sheep. Now, you remember when I talked to you Sunday morning about the gate, the door, and the veil? You remember those three? All right. I started to use some of that tonight, but I didn't. And I, I may use it, I don't know, maybe Sunday night or sometime. 
But think about this for a moment. The gate is something that opens outside the gate. But the door, he said, I am the door. The door is something that opens up into a spiritual sanctuary. In other words, when you go through that door, you're in a place now that's entirely different than standing out there looking at that brazen altar. See? In other words, Christ says that I can open the door if you'll come through me. I'll come and you can come into the holy place. But then there's the veil. And the veil is even more sacred and separated than the door. A veil. Think about that for a moment. His flesh is the veil. In other words, he said, you come in here to the holy place. You let the Holy Ghost illumine that showbread and this altar of incense. And let that begin part of your life. And I mean really become part of your life. All at the time that's right, let you go through that veil into the Holy of Holies. And in there, and you ever thought about this? The Ark of the Covenant and cherubim in that veil, behind the veil, yes, and blood. Those three things, the Ark of the Covenant, which had in it three things. Well, those three things in, the, in that Ark of the Covenant. One was Aaron's rod that budded, right? All right, pot of manna, right? What was the third one? What, tables of stone, yes, yes. These are right, law, rod, the priesthood, all right? And what was that other one? Pot of manna. Christ is the manna, right? He's the priest. And he is the one who wrote that table of stone with his finger when Moses was on top of that mountain, safe and secure in the Ark of the Covenant with a mercy seat down on top of it of pure gold. The only place that could keep those three things had to be that in typology of our Lord Jesus Christ. Nothing else could keep that. And so it is. He said, I'm the door. John 10, he said, I'm the good shepherd. The good shepherd giveth his life for the sheep. Amen. And they're still doing that today. I told you about that girl that crawled up in this culvert. All you could see was the bottom of her feet. And this thing is on YouTube. It's still on there. You might be able to find it. And she's in here, and she comes crawling out of this culvert, and she's got two little goats in her hand, little old boogers, about this big. And she comes out of there with them, and she's got them in her hand, soaking wet mud all over her, no telling what she could have run into inside this thing. It took courage for her to crawl in there. Yes, it did, but she was a shepherd. And she looked out for her sheep, and she came out with those little goats, set them down, and they took right off for mama. It's quite a thing to watch that. It reminded me of what a shepherd was all about. It reminded me of what David said. You remember what he said David did? David said, I have even pulled the bones out of the mouth of the lion, of the predator. He said, I've done that. He said, I've taken the bones out of their mouth. In other words, he said, I've had to kill them. I've killed them. I've come against the bear. I've come against the lion. I've come against anything that comes against my sheep. So if he'd come against the bear, he'd come against the lion, he'd come against anything that came against his sheep, Goliath, you're hurting, son. <laughs> Who are you, uncircumcised Philistine, to defy the armies of the living God? Amen, boy. You talk about being mad. Goliath got mad, didn't he? Yes, he did. He said, what am I, a dog, that you come to me like this? Well, truth of the matter is, you wasn't much more because he took care of you, killed you with your own sword. And then in, he said in John 11, I'm the resurrection, the life. He that believeth in me, though he were dead, yet shall he live. He said, he that believeth in me shall never die. Aren't you glad God defeated that? Aren't you glad you don't have to worry about dying? Yeah. You'll never, go through the, you'll never go through what Jacob went through. You'll never go through what any Old Testament saint went through, you see. To be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. Immediately. That's right. Immediately. To be with him. In John chapter number 14, he said, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh the Father but by me. You notice, if you are on the right way and truth and life, you know where you'll wind up? With Christ. If whatever way you're on tonight, whatever truth that you embrace tonight, 
whatever philosophy that you, that you, that you, that you live by tonight, if it's not leading you to Christ, you're in a, you're in a cult. You're in the wrong thing. Amen. And then finally, he said in John 15, he said, I'm the true vine. My father's the husbandman, the true vine. This is a comparison to Israel. In, in Isaiah 5, he said, I planted you a noble vine, and look what you've done. You've turned into this degenerate plant. He said, but I did everything that was right to do to see to it that it wouldn't happen to you. Well, he is the true vine, and, uh, and, 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 and God the Father is the husbandman. They have their counterpart and their counterfeit. Every last one of these truths are counterfeited. So how do you teach a man to know something that's a counterfeit? That's what we need to do. I remember when I was, I had my shop one time on, on the Oak Ridge Highway. I forget what happened. I don't remember what it was. But I wound up with a $20 bill. I looked at that thing and I thought, man, that's an odd looking $20 bill. It didn't take me too long to say, now look what I've got in my hand. This is a, this is a counterfeit piece of junk. <laughs> it was counterfeit. <laughs> so what do you do? Well, you wait till the guy's coming next, you know. Uh, <laughs> could you give me change for a 20? <laughs> I'm afraid that that's what most people do, you know, get rid of it as fast as they can. I don't know what I did with it. But I saw that. I knew it. I said, how did you know it was a counterfeit? Well, I knew what a real one looked like. <laughs> that's the thing. I know the real Christ. Unless you know the real one, you won't know the counterfeit. Amen. That's what's important. You got to know the real one. Once you know the real one, you'll know the counterfeit. When you see it, you certainly will. And that's how they say they teach them. They teach them to, to be very, very meticulous. Everything about it that they need to learn to identify the real. That way, when they see the counterfeit, then they'll know that, uh, that they have the counterfeit. John chapter number 17 he said, Thou hast given them power over all flesh, that he should give eternal life to as many as thou hast given him. And this is life eternal, that they might know thee, the only true God in Jesus Christ, whom thou hast sent. Notice the wording. The Lord Jesus Christ is life eternal. See, the person of Christ. 1 John chapter 5 and verse number 20. The same John who wrote the Gospel of John writes 1st, 2nd, and 3rd John. And here's what he said in 1 John 5, 20. We know that the Son of God is come and hath given us an understanding that we may know him that is true and we are in him that is true, even in his Son, Jesus Christ. This is the true God and eternal life. There he is again, calling Christ eternal life. And I'll finish with this statement from Titus. Titus chapter number one and verse number two. Titus, of course, is what we call the Pauline epistle. And the word epistle is simply a, a letter. It's what it means. And in, first, in, in Titus chapter 1 and verse number 2, it said, In hope of eternal life, which God that cannot lie promised before the world began. And he can't lie, folks. If you call upon his name, believing that Christ died for your sin, according to the scripture. You believe Jesus Christ is divine, God Almighty's Son, equal with the Father. You believe that. You believe it. You really believe it. He said, for whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. That's what he said in Romans chapter number 10. He cannot lie. A lot of people have a problem. They wait for a feeling. They think, well, you know, I believe everything, but I'm, shouldn't I feel something? And so they're not trusting the integrity of God to do what he said he will do. They're trusting their own emotions and feelings to give them the security they need. And folks, that'll get you messed up. I'm all for shouting. I'm all for emotion. And all that's all fine in this place. But folks, we don't serve Christ tonight on emotion. We serve him on his word. Did he say it? Will he not do it? He cannot lie. That's an impossibility. And notice how, the, how that, the, that the apostle says it, that cannot lie. He can't die. He can't lie. There are certain things that God cannot do simply because of his nature and who he is. 
Well, I'm thankful tonight that when I bowed my head, I said, Lord Jesus. I don't remember the words, but I do remember my soul, and I remember my condition before God, and I know what happened. <laughs> That's amazing. 1973. It's been uh, 50 one years now, 51 years, 51 years, just as precious, more precious now than it was then. Father, bless your word. I pray that if we have anybody in the house tonight or watching this thing live, watch it later. Watch it on television, hear it on the radio, wherever it goes out, whatever media you use, whatever. I pray that you'd anoint the word that would have become very plain and simple to the heart and that they would call upon thee and do what you said to do in the Gospel of John. Simply believe and take you at your word and trust in your integrity. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. All right, I'm done, folks. I'm done. Amen. We uh, take your prayer request tonight. It's good to see Jean. She's been coming now. She spent some time in the hospital. Probably a week or so, didn't you? Yeah. Yeah. Had an infection in her lungs. And I guess you're taking medication for that tonight. I want you to keep praying for her. Would you do that, please? Pray for Jean. Uh, David Benson, Monday, was supposed to have stent put in. Uh, they wanted to do open heart surgery, but he doesn't want to do it. And I understand. I, I understand. And he's got uh, a blockage in his heart. And uh, I know David. I've known David a long time. Go back a long time with, with Brother Benson. Please pray for him tonight. David Benson and the situation with his heart. Anybody have a request? Yes, ma'am. Pardon? Yeah, that's right. I forgot about that. Sure. Um, I don't usually like to request prayer for myself, but um, I'm having some intense medical tests done in the next week. So if you could pray for me, I'd really appreciate it. Yes, ma'am. And I also want to thank the Lord for being so good to me. Amen. Saving my unworthy soul. He's been so good to me. Amen. He's answered prayers that I didn't even know to pray for. Yeah. Okay. And um, remember my family, and I have a very special and spoken request. All right. Amen. Amen. Okay. Anybody on this side over here? Back in the back there. The folks online, folks, that watch as we live stream, we had so many of them tell us that they'd like to hear the prayer request. And so this is what's going on when we, when we do this. Yes, sir, go ahead. Uh, remember my grandmother in your prayers? She's been diagnosed with breast cancer, trying to figure out the best route of how she wants to go about that. And my mom has a very important doctor's appointment coming up, and we're still waiting on results from the last appointment, and uh, we're just praying for, for good results. And I'd just like to praise the Lord for uh, what he did over in Mexico when I was there. And um, we, we're blessed here, people. I mean, seeing these people in a foreign country that have nothing. I mean, they have, they have nothing. And we take for granted the things that we have so often. Pastor, God, God's been good to us. And, and we're, we're beyond blessed no matter what happens from here on out. Amen. All right. Yes, ma'am. I'd like to request prayer for our granddaughter, Addie. She's 11, and uh, she is in intensive care out in um, the hospital in Spokane, Washington. She uh, is having some heart issues, and they keep uh, the blood oxygen level keeps going too low. So um, I would just request prayer. Y'all just help us pray. Yes, ma'am. Amen. Amen. All right. Sister Black up here. My sister in Texas um, has an atrial flutter going on with her heart. Yeah. And she was in the um, 
ER yesterday, they gave her medication and sent her home, but they can't regulate it. They can't seem to regulate it. So she's in the hospital right now. Okay. All right. All right, anybody else? Are we on this side? Just continue to remember my brother in your prayers, please. Okay, brother. Spoken request tonight. All right. Yes, ma'am. I went to see Ruby Keith today, and she wasn't feeling well at all. She didn't look good, but just pray for her. Yes, ma'am. Amen. All right. Okay. Well, let's pray. Brother Sean McDaniels, lead us in prayer, prayer please. Amen, folks. God bless you. We, Lord willing, meet Sunday morning, 10 o'clock. And uh, you're having, you've got your, what time did you say your thing was with the choir? 5 o'clock Saturday. So y'all keep that in mind. All right. God bless you.